We have been uh, in this uh, message series, as I said, called Haunting uh, Relationships. And how do we, how do we love the people uh, that, that suck the life out of us? Because we all have them. All right, uh, how many of you would agree that there are people in your life that just suck the life out of you? Yeah, it is. Sometimes it is just uh, draining. We've talked about controlling people. We've talked about critical people. Uh, we're, next week, we're going to talk about the hypocrites and, and what that looks like and how do we love those people and do we actually say something to them? Do we speak into their life or do we just let them go? Uh, we're going to talk about that next week and it's going to be a, a, a real uh, a good teaching on that. But today I want to talk about how do we love the people in our lives that, that can be overly needy? Like the people that, that we really do care about them, we really do love them, we really do want what's best for them. Like how do we respond to, to the overly needy people? And uh, I'm just going to be honest with you, this is an area that I struggle with. So really what you're going to get to do today is kind of really just, you're going to get to listen to a conversation that I'm having with me. If it helps you, great. Like if not, come back next week, we'll talk about something different. Um, but, but I have struggled for years and years and years in ministry, I've struggled with how do we really help the needy people, uh, the overly needy people in our lives. So as I've been thinking about this and, and coming to some things, really like this is just kind of going through my head. I am by no means an expert in this area. It's pro- I'm terrible at this. So you're just going to listen to me yell at myself for a bit, and we're going to go on. But there is a, there is a spiritual uh, principle that in every group, every family, every small group, every team, like there is always at least one needy, crazy person. Like in fact, I, the Bible says that where two or three are gathered, at least one of them is crazy or, or something like that. Like, but, but how many, like, there's always a crazy person. How many would agree with that? Come on, we, we participate. Yeah, and if, look at, look at the people that are not raising their hand. They're the crazy people. Like, the, those are the ones. So how do we deal with those people who are always in need? How do we, how do we love them and care for them uh, with, without actually hurting them? Because, like, you know, you, you know who I'm talking about. You see these people coming. You, like, you know that this conversation is going to take a long time. I ain't getting out of here in just a couple minutes. Sometimes they're negative. Like maybe they, they tell you the same story over and over again. Uh, they're always the, the victim. I can't believe this happened to me. Like, and, and sometimes you do something out of the goodness of your heart, out of the kindness of your heart, but it's never enough. You give and they seem to want even more. It could be uh, the relative that you love. Um, but the person, that they're mostly alone all the time and, and they need support. It could be the, the guy at work who doesn't have a whole lot of friends and they're just always needy. It could be that, that buddy who's always in need of more money, more money, more money. It could be the person at the office that's always fishing for compliments. Do, do I look okay today? Do you like this? Am I doing good? It could be your friend who's just a hot mess. Like, and they're always on the struggle bus. Like, and if you know somebody right now, don't, don't point at them because that's not good. But, that, but that's what I'm talking about. And it becomes complicated as followers of Christ. Like, these people that we really, really do care about. Like, we, we really do love them. Like, I'm not saying that they're just, they're strangers out there. Like I said, it breaks our heart to see them struggle, to see them in so much need. Like, how do we deal with that. Because if we start to pull back and regroup, here's what happens. And I know this is from my own life, my own experience. If I pull back and, and I start to regroup and, and, and not be so helpful to those people, what happens is that I begin to feel guilty because I'm leaving them stranded or, or in the weeds. Like we want to help, but if, if we help them in the wrong way, it actually ends up hurting them and can hurt us. So how do we love those people who are just always in need? That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to look at three big thoughts on how do we help those without actually hurting them. And there's a couple of books that I've been wanting to read for years that, that I haven't, um, and I still haven't, but one's called When Helping Hurts, and the other's called Toxic Charity. Uh, just two, two books that, that I think would revolutionize uh, the way we help people if I'd ever sit down and read them. Um, but the first thought I want to tell you about today, and, and I hope it'll sink in, 
is that, that when we give, we want to give strategically. Like we want to give strategically. Because most of the time we don't give strategically. Most of the time, what do we do? We give emotionally. And we see a need and because we care, we just, we just react. And the first thing is that it's, and it's easy, it's convenient, and, and, and it makes us feel good when we can help. So we give emotionally. Like we, we, we do what's gonna relieve our guilt. So, so we wanna give strategically, we wanna, we wanna change that. So instead of focusing on, on just what they want or, or what's going to relieve our guilt or make us feel better, instead we wanna ask, what do they really need? Like, what, what will genuinely help these people? Not just, not just in the moment. Like, what would help them long term? And as I was thinking about this, and Sandy, I'm departing from the notes completely, so please don't pay attention. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the, the Jewish people. Like, what they wanted was they wanted a political Messiah. They, they were looking for, and for hundreds and hundreds of years, like, they were thinking, God's going to send us someone, and he's going to deliver us from this political uh, uh, oppression from Rome. Uh, he did it in the past. He delivered us out of Egypt. He delivered us uh, from the Babylonians. He delivered us from the Chaldeans. He delivered us from all of these people. What God's going to do is God's going to send us this person who's going to rise up and deliver us from this political oppression. And they would have been happy with that. That's what they wanted. And one of the things that got Jesus killed was that he was not that guy. He said, if I give you what you want, it's not going to be eternal. But God looked down and said, hey, I'm going to, in Jesus, I'm going to give you what you need. The problem is not that you're in physical slavery under Rome. The problem is that you're in spiritual slavery under sin, and there's no way that you're going to have life apart from me. And he gave them what they needed. There's a, a time in, in the book of Acts, um, right after the, the start of the church, after the day of Pentecost, Peter and John, like they're, they're walking into the temple, it says in Acts chapter three, and, and it shows us, gives us an example of, of how we give strategically or, or what we need to do strategically. There was a man that was sitting there and he was in serious need. Like his friends would bring him every day and they would set him by the, um, by the, the en entrance to the temple and he would just sit there begging for money. What he wanted was money. Um, and people would give him exactly what he wanted. Like day after day, they'd give him exactly what he wanted. And so this guy is sitting there and one day and, and he's in need and Peter and John are about to enter. And what's that guy doing? That guy's sitting there with his cup out. He's saying, hey, give me, give me what I need. And Peter looks straight at him and, and, and so does John. And, and it said, hey, look at us. Give, give your attention to us. And that guy's probably getting excited. He's thinking, oh, they're gonna give me some money. Like they are going to give me what, what I'm expecting but what they did was something totally different. But this guy understood a principle that was sitting there. He said, if I ask long enough and I'm consistent enough in my asking, somebody's going to give me what I need or what I want. And there's, there, somewhere along the way, there's going to be an emotional response to that. May not be everybody, but somebody's gonna have an emotional response and they're gonna give me what I'm asking for. Because this guy had learned every single day that, hey, these people, they're going to take me down there. They're going to sit me down there. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to, to beg and I'm going to ask for money. And there are going to be some people that are going to walk by and they're going to throw some money in because it's going to, going to make them feel a little bit better. But that's not what he really needed. And Peter and John understood that. Like the guy wanted, he, he wanted what was easy. It would have been simple for Peter and John to throw in a couple of bucks, a couple of coins, and went on their merry way. But Peter and John, like they didn't respond emotionally. But led by the Spirit and under the power of God, they gave the guy not what he wanted, but, but instead they gave the guy what he needed. And that's how the story goes. Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ I give you rise up and walk. And it says that he took him by the hand and, and, and what did he do? He took him by the hand and he helped him to his feet. And his ankles became strong and, and the guy went dancing and singing and, and praising God. So instead of giving him a hand out, what Peter and John did was he reached down and gave him a hand up. 
And I think strategically, like that's what we have to do. Like we don't have to look for the emotional response. Strategically, we have to look at how we're going to give that are going to give people this hand up instead of this hand out. Because oftentimes a hand out doesn't help any. Now what a needy person is going to do the moment you start doing that is they're going to try to make you feel guilty. Well, 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 if you loved me, you would just give me what I'm asking for. If you loved me, you'd give me what I want. You'd give me time. You'd, you'd give me money. Because that's what I want. But we have to have the wisdom and the real love to, to say, hey, because I love you, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what you need. Like we're going to do it strategically. Well, I really need $300 to make my car payment. I need $300 to make my car payment. And you may know, oh, well, hey, they, they just bought an Apple Watch and a pair of Yeezys and they're playing Fortnite instead of getting a job. Like anybody know that person I'm talking about? Like what we may say is you want $300 to pay your car payment, but what you need is to get off the couch and get a job. Like I'm not gonna validate you or approve of your behavior when what you need is, is something way more than $300. Like what you need is you, you may need to, to be uh, validated and, and you may need time and you may, you may want all of these things, but really what you need is you need to understand who you are in Jesus Christ, that you are more valuable than, than what the world's saying about you. Like I can't continue to meet that need that I was never designed to meet. Like I'm gonna help you find who you are in Christ. Like a lot of people are like, you want more time with me? Well, what you really need is you need to understand your identity in Christ. Your identity is not found in me. It's found in Jesus. So you need to see that you are valuable to God. And I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about all needy people and you and I both. But like we're not what they need. What they need is to understand who they are in Jesus. And that Jesus uses his family, broader family, to meet needs, not just us as individuals. This may be what you want, but God's leading me to give you what you need. But it's so easy when we see someone in need to do what makes us feel good. And what's easy, what's not going to cause any trouble. But what's right may take more wisdom, more discernment, more courage, more time, more sacrifice. But because we're followers of Christ, we don't just go and, and relieve an immediate need. We give them a hand up instead of a hand out. I said, and this is a lesson that, I, that God is really trying to speak to me uh, over the course of the last several years, really, of how are we helping people? Because a lot, because it's easy. And I'm going to be honest, I'm probably one of the most gullible uh, generous people you'll ever meet. You come to me with a need, listen, I'm going to give it to you most of the time. But it's got to change because I'm not helping a lot of people. What I'm doing is actually hurting them. And as a church, we've got to get this right. As followers of Christ, we've got to get this right if we're going to create a community that's changing the world. So we're going to give strategically. Uh, number two is what we're going to do is we're going to serve wisely. We, we serve wisely. Look at the way Jesus cared for people. You know, what, what did he do? He served selflessly. He, he loved authentically. He gave generously. He taught faithfully. He listened compassionately. And then occasionally what we'd see him do is that he would step off, go aside, uh, and reconnect with God to recharge spiritually. And then he would go serve faithfully again. Like you see this rhythm in, in kind of in Jesus' life over and over again. I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving. I'm going to retreat for a time. To, to rebuild, to restore, to refresh, and then I'm going to go out and give again. Like I'm going to give, and then I'm going to unplug, and I'm going to give again. You know, there's, there's two problems, really, with this area in, in followers of Christ. Is we say, hey, I'm burnt out. I'm going to, to, to unplug for a while, which is fine. But then we unplug for six months to a year, and we never jump back in and serve. And what happens is we're really disconnecting from God completely. Or that we never unplug at all, Josh, and we give and we give and we give and we give until, we, until we're empty and we have nothing good to give anymore. 
So we've got to, again, this is something we've got to get right. We've got to learn how to, to disconnect, how to unplug for a minute and let God fill us back up in order that we can go out and give and give and give and give some more. In Mark chapter one, starting in verse 35, it says this, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went uh, off to a solitary place where he prayed. It's just me and God time. Just me and the father. Like we're, 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 we're getting this. And then it says, Simon and his companions went to look for Jesus. And what I'm about to tell you is, is exactly what happens to moms who go into the bathroom for just a break from the kids. Moms, you know, you know what I mean? Like he went off and played and Simon was like, hey, Jesus, where are you? We need you, where you at? And it says, when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. So it's like you go to the bathroom and you shut the door and you just, like, you just want privacy. Like you don't even have to go to the bathroom. But the next thing you hear is, mom, mom, where are you? And you're quiet and you're not trying to breathe out loud. And then there's fingers going underneath the door. Like everyone's looking for you, mom. And that's kind of what it was for Jesus. Like he tried to get off by himself and everyone's looking for him. But what happens when you're, when you're on an airplane? What do they always tell you? If the plane loses altitude and the oxygen mask comes down, it says, hey, put yours on first and then help everyone around you. So you put your mask on and then you choose which kid you're gonna put the mask on next. <laughs> I'll leave you for last. Because <laughs> listen, if you're not healthy, if you're not in a good place, you can't help anyone else. Think about the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. And this guy, um, he gets beat up and he's left for dead and this Samaritan comes along, which is a miracle in itself that a Samaritan would help a Jew. And, but it's a beautiful story. So the, the Samaritan bandages the guy up who's in need. He cares for him. He puts some oil on him. He puts him on his own donkey, takes him to town, puts him in a hotel and says, hey, you take care of this guy. I'll pay you the money when I come back. And I've never thought about this before, but think about it. Where did he go and why did he leave? The answer is I have no idea. Because Jesus didn't tell us that in the story. But I can assume some things about it. Like either he went back to his mama or his wife, his kids, or he went back to work. Because when you work, you get paid. And when you get paid, you can pay for somebody else to stay in a hotel on you. Like he, he, he went back and in some form or fashion, he did what he had to do to keep his health um, moving so that he could be in a posture to help someone else later down the road. Like every now and then we have to unplug. Craig Rochelle says it this way, uh, if you, can't, you can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. You can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. Like how do you help someone who's in, in need? Well, you wanna be able to pour out uh, like a, a full cup because once you're empty, you've got nothing to give. Like, so we're gonna give strategically, we're gonna serve wisely, and then number three, we're, we're just gonna trust completely. Like, we're, we're gonna trust completely. Like, God, we're gonna do what you've asked, and I've said this before, that our responsibility is obedience. God's in charge of results. And, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna trust God to be faithful to his word and that he's going to take care of the results. Because here's the problem, it's dangerous and it's insulting to ever, for me or, or any of us to ever think that I am someone's answer. It's insulting and dangerous for you to think that you're the source that's going to meet someone else's needs. And listen, it's dishonoring to God to say that, that we are necessary in every case to see that every need is met. We're not someone else's answer. Jesus is the answer. Like we exist to lead people to take their next step in a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Not with any of our elders, not with Josh, not with Todd, not with Jeremy, not with, with anyone else. We, we exist to lead people to take their next step in a life-changing relationship with Jesus. He's the answer. Yeah, we may be the delivery system. We may have a part of that, but he's the power. You know, the problem is if you think God needs you to fix everyone else's needs, your God is too small. If you think you're necessary in every way, like you may be short-circuiting a process that God has put into place, not, not to rescue someone, but to bring about restoration to someone, to bring about healing to someone. 
Paul said it this way. He was teaching about actions and spiritual consequences in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He said, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Man gets back what he plants. You know, we're just having harvest season around here. You're like, you get back, you, you reap what you sow. He says, whoever sows to please their flesh, their sinful nature, from the flesh will reap destruction. Like that's God's principle of the harvest. But then he says, there's some good news. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So we do, we do what's right and we trust God completely. And this principle is true all throughout scriptures that there are consequences to behavior. In fact, I love the story in Luke's gospel in, in Luke chapter 15, it's known as the, the prodigal son. What happened there is dad had two kids. One of the kids said, hey, I want my money. Uh, dad, I wish you were dead. Um, and give me your money. I want to go party. And dad ended up granting the son's request. He went out and broke his father's heart. He dishonored every value that the family had. He went and lived wild, sinful life. Like, I mean, it was crazy. Like the father prayed every day, says, for his son to come home. Father hoped every day that, that, that the son would come home and he never did. You know what the father never did? He never rescued the son. He loved him enough to let the son end up in the pig pen, eating the pig stuff. When the son finally went, hey, this isn't working very good, the scripture says it came to his senses. Like his sinful decisions took him to a place that he thought he would never have gotten to. And listen, that's what sin always does. It takes us to a place we never thought we would get to. So maybe I should go back and apologize to my dad and see if he'll take me back as a servant. I know I'm unworthy, but he came to his senses. The father loved him enough, listen, to let the son suffer the God-given consequences of, of sin in his life. We need to understand that rescuing is not always helping. Mama, I'm talking to you. Dad, I'm talking to you. Rescuing is not always helping. Sister, listen, if she's all, your sister's always late to work every day and you're the alarm clock, maybe they need to lose their job to realize the importance of waking up on time. If somebody's partying their brains out all day long and they're gonna uh, lose a scholarship or something, they, they may need to lose their scholarship to, and suffer the consequences of that. Someone continues to charge up debt and go on vacation and buy new outfits and, and they can't make their rent payment. Like Maybe they need to be put out on the street for a while to understand the importance of paying a rent payment. Like Sometimes you have to let people and, and this sounds cruel and, and it's not it's actually not cruel at all it's actually the most loving thing we can do because we're not always helping and, and what I hope we'll do is from a posture of humility like listen never arrogance like we're not here to meet a need or here to save a day like I heard one guy say well, well this is my project person some people are not projects like they're not People in need are not projects. They're people that we love and we want to help to, to get to a relationship with Jesus. And we love them in the name of Jesus because ultimately, ultimately one day we're gonna realize how needy we really are for Jesus. We're gonna realize the effects of our own sin, how it's destroyed relationships in our lives, how it's separated us from this uh, place that God wants us to be in. Like, I love when I get to go to, to a very poor country or nation or the area of Costa Rica that I get to go to or Guatemala or Honduras. And, and I always think, man, I'm going to go there and I'm going to help them. I've got so much to bring. And I start looking around and going, hey, wait a minute. They may have some material needs in their life, but they've got this peace and they've got this joy and they've got this contentment that, that I, I don't have. Maybe there's a spiritual need in, in my life that they can meet. Suddenly, we begin to realize that I can't really experience his presence as well as on my own as I can with somebody else, that I can't do life alone, that God put me here to, yes, to help meet some needs, but, but also there's some needs that I have that I need met in my life. I got a personal relationship with Jesus is good, but I'm convinced a shared one is even better. When two or three are gathered in my name, 
says, I'm there in a different way. I show up. Like you can pray for me from a distance, but it's so much more powerful if you take my hand and we're praying together. Like suddenly we're mutually in need. We're mutually broken. Sinners going before a savior and suddenly he's lifting uh, us up together. This is what David said. He said, as for me, I'm poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God, you are my help, my deliverer, Lord, do not delay. So in any moment, listen, when we look at someone else and say, hey, I'm here to help meet your need, like, no, like well, we're here just to point people to Jesus. And in the same way, maybe you can point me to Jesus because none of us have reached that, that final step yet because we're all needy. We're all equally broken, equally sinful, equally uh, people in, in, in need of a savior named Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. Like there's no other way. And all of us have been, been, been in that situation where, where the decisions that we've made, like they have consequences. And some of us, some of you, you that, that are here today, you've had to experience consequences for, from a life that, and, I, like, and I'm, I'm sorry. But there's also eternal consequences to all of our decisions. And but it says the wages of sin is death. That what we've earned, the consequence of our sin is that it's separated us from God to a place that, that eternally we can't be with him. But it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. And today there are some that for the very first time you need to say, hey, I've suffered enough earthly consequences. I've done it. And God may not take those away, but you don't have to suffer eternal consequences. And today is a day that you need to, to give those to Christ. There's a day that say, Jesus, on you, on the cross, on what you've done, like I'm just laying everything to you, that I need you. And I believe when we begin to experience and understand how needy we really are for a savior, it will change the way we look at the other people in our lives and will truly desire to help them in a way that's helping and not hurting. So today I'm gonna to ask you to stand and if there's a decision that, that you need to make, uh, my prayer is that you would have the boldness to make that today. Father God, I'm thankful today that you have taken care of our greatest need, that the sin and the consequences of that in our lives, that there are some earthly consequences, but but even that, there are eternal consequences that if we don't hand over to you, like we're, we're gonna suffer. But Lord, I thank you that we have good news, that, that we have a savior, that we have a helper who met our need, that Jesus was willing to go to a cross and suffer and die for us. So I pray today for any here that need to make a decision to, to hand over that to you. I pray that they would do that, they'd accept Christ into their life and in, in baptism have the sin washed away to receive the gift of the Spirit in their lives. Lord, I pray as, as a church and as a body of, of believers um, that you would help us to really give strategically and serve wisely and, and trust you completely as we try to help people, not, not in the moment, not emotionally, but we really try to point them to a life-changing relationship through Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.